in the last few minutes of our sitting together. Again, if you wish to bring awareness carefully within the body and going through that, with the awareness infused with kindness, with care, empathy and equanimity. Just notice the areas of the body that feel open and other areas that feel closed or shut down or tight without clinging to the one or rejecting the other. Also notice the areas of the body that feel safe, that can be an internal touchstone. Both in formal, formal, formal meditation practice, or as we move about our day and threat, threatening or difficult information or news with the potential to bring up anxiety, we know where to go. We know where we can hold that anxiety without being overwhelmed that fear or our wishes for change. All things can fit within our, the awareness of kindness and compassion. empathy, equanimity, the most challenging, the most difficult, and all the good things happening, all the connection, momentum for transformation. Know these places in the body, in the heart. Michelle, if you can hear me, can you ring a bell? Or anyone who has a bell, can you ring it? I have a little bell. Awesome. So lovely to see you all. Pam, Australia, Canada, Hawaii. Welcome. Jesse? Yeah, thank you, Steve. That was beautiful. Just taking a moment to look at everybody here. Really really awesome 
You all look pretty chilled out. Mm. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, if there's, a, so we had a technical issue somehow, you know, we paid for a 500 person meeting and it's still only letting 100 people in at a time. If there's folks who you know who are trying to get in, you can let them know that um, it is also streaming on the Facebook page, of Vipassana Hawaii's Facebook page. You can check it out there. And the recording will be up on the website <clears throat> uh, this evening. Mm, I have a lot more notes and things uh, than I'll definitely have <laughs> time for of all these things that I, I want to cover and just address. I think we're, um, you know, as everyone knows, we're just living in such incredible times. And um, I think the, you know, the pain that is being finally shared in some broader way um, particularly on, you know, racial injustice, the joy of like the possibility of, you know, really addressing these in meaningful ways uh, as not just a society, but as many societies, right? This is sort of around the world, the, um, the movement to address, you know, the, all the many degrees of injustice against black people that have been perpetuated for centuries and and then the, you know, fears about the economy and fears about the, you know, continued uh, COVID reality and um, what are the conditions that the, the pressure that we've all been under in terms of just the quarantine and social distancing and the president and all the crazy things he's spewing and just the, the sort of intensity of the, of the moment is on so many levels, it's so amazing. Um, and I know that there's, you know, a lot of folks who wonder in our circles of just like, what, what is it as a Buddhist, um, as a yogi, as someone who's, you know, deeply committed to these practices, what, what's the appropriate response? What's the, how do we, how do we deal internally <laughs> with the incredible range of emotional experience that's being evoked right now? How do we engage one another in ways that are meaningful, supportive, not recreating uh, systems of oppression? How do we engage the sort of bigger systems of change um, or the bigger systems in our world in a way to enact change um, that feels in alignment with our spiritual values? And um, I don't have an answer, <laughs> but I do feel like I have a lot of, um, I have a lot of thoughts about it. I have a lot of uh, practice around the, of course the meditation practice, but around the, you know, methods and approaches of, of how people try to do this. Um, but I also feel like in the last period of time, the last couple of years, I've, as someone who is, and has always been really deeply committed to social justice and social change and then encountering these teachings um, so inspired and enlivened by the possibility of the internal liberation process. Um, I, I've always been someone who's really tried to look at like where are those things related and um, how do they support each other. And I, I think that I've come to a place right now to where I really do feel that there are meaningful ways that they can support one another, um, that they can form one another, that our um, spiritual values and practices and approaches can um, manifest in ways that are socially relevant and, and of, of social benefit. I think there are ways that the movement for social change can be powerful teachers for us in our own spiritual practice, um, literally and metaphorically. And I've also come to really 
appreciate the places where they're different and um, where they might be in conflict with one another and where my desire to have them be totally unified is um, not fair actually to either approach, to either practice, to either strategic application of energy, right? That, that the strategies for social change um, in a lot of ways are really actually not that well addressed by the Buddha or the Dharma, the Buddha's Dharma or our meditation practice, that there are, that there are ways that they can be influenced by them. There are metaphorical things that are meaningful and I'll, you know, get into some of those, but I, I do feel um, like offering a little bit of just the degree to which I think that to be truly, a truly dedicated social justice practitioner uh, person and, and someone really dedicated to social change and ending oppression of any kind in the world, um, that it really does require an honest um, disappointment with the Buddha, uh, with, with realizing that he and what he taught and what he offered actually wasn't designed to address uh, social change and that there are ways in which it's like you can see a lot of what he did mm, didn't address it in his own time <laughs> and actually uh, d avoided dealing with a lot of of the dynamics and that that's just a truth that I think is actually more healthy in terms of then what do we decide to do as Buddhists or as practitioners or as yogis I think you know the Buddha is often given a lot of credit for um, the fact that he allowed the monastic sangha to be joined by people of lower castes, the delits, the so-called untouchable caste. Um, and that's true that he did, or apparently, you know, historically, it's, it's understood that that's true. But it's also important to recognize that that wasn't really unique to the Buddha. Actually, all of the renunciate sects at that era, that was standard practice, that you didn't, uh, people from any caste could join. Um, and what you often actually find, uh, which can be very hard to see, is that really actually most of the monks and nuns that are famous that you know about, uh, Moggallana, Sariputta, most, most of the ones, they're all from the Brahmin caste. They're all, there's very few stories or examples in the suttas of people of the lower castes uh, having leadership roles in the, in the Sangha, leadership roles. Um, and so whether that was something that the Buddha himself was responsible for or the, the culture of the Sangha that came after that decided, oh, we're going to compile these stories and who are these stories going to be about? It was something very much not addressed. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, you know, you weren't supposed to talk about the kings and queens, right? And uh, what's happening in the villages. The idea of talking about politics and talking about the sort of uh, debates in society was frowned upon, you know, that this idea of like, don't, you know, if, if this is a very particular flavor of liberation we're talking about in terms of his teaching and um, that in that era, there was a very extreme encouragement to to move away from it, you know, he did, the Buddha eventually allowed women into the, the monastic Sangha, but only after like a lot of wrangling uh, from Ananda, probably more likely others as well, from his own stepmother, who he didn't want to allow to be a nun. <laughs> and finally, when they did allow women to join, they were always second class. They always had to, they had a bunch of extra rules that they had to um, abide by. Um, and it wasn't that he didn't feel they were capable of enlightenment. That was very clear that he did. He knew that, that women were just as capable of awakening as men. It, it seems he didn't really want to deal with the social repercussions of it, like of what the, the kerfuffle that would call uh, up in the, in the society around him. Um, there are a number of things. You know, when conflict would arise, there was a phrase that they would use in the Sangha of uh, covering it with grass. And that's what you would do with like an animal's excrement right? You just cover it with grass. You don't really deal with it. You just kind of like put it to side. And that was like a ethic of the early Sangha. Even now, um, if you try to ordain as a monk, at least, uh, there's no full female ordination anymore in most of Southeast Asia in this tradition, though it is growing back in some places. Um, 
you're, you, they'll ask you if you're a slave and if you have permission to join the order. And if you don't, you're not supposed to be allowed to, or, to ordain. You know, that's still something that is going on. Uh, if you have debts, you're not allowed to. If you're sick with leprosy, you're not allowed to join. Um, they also make sure that you have to honestly say you're not a, a dragon spirit hiding as a human. So you can see that, like, it's, it's just important to really appreciate that the Buddha himself and the early Sangha actually didn't figure out all these problems, that they covered a lot of them over. It was totally undemocratic, right? There was no, no one had say in the rules besides the Buddha himself. Um, and, and that was the form that was created at that point to, to address the particular qualities that were, the Buddha felt were needed in order to really, um, you know, pursue this path. And on the basic level, the Buddha wasn't even going to teach at all. He just was going to, he got enlightened. He was like, wow, this is amazing and so difficult that probably no one else can even do this. And they had to have like Brahma himself had to come down and convince the Buddha to, to try to teach, to try to help other people. So, you know, you can see that there, there are very deep ways in our tradition here in which you have to, if you care about the world and you care about helping the world and being a meaningful agent of change in the world, that you... I would say at this point that it's it's responsible of us to be honest about the reality of what this the, the history of our own tradition and of what the Buddha saw as the requisite um, needs for this practice and and where they may or may not be in alignment with our hopes. Now that isn't to say that we. I guess maybe I'll just say that like there are. Uh, lots of you know most of us in this room are in the west most of us as far as i can tell are lay people <laughs> you know we're not living in caves we're not in monasteries and secluded we are in the world and we want to take responsibility for our place in the world and and the oppression of the world and whatever privileges uh you may or may not have that 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 is a beautiful and important um calling but it's a beautiful important calling mostly as a human and as a uh as a social being and the question of where it fits into our practice, I think is something and where it fits into being our identity as a Buddhist, I think is more complex. And um, the good news is, is that you don't need to go to the Buddha for answers of how to change society because there are a lot of other people who have a lot of training and a lot of experience of how to go about doing that, right? There's a deep knowledge in the world of how do you change institutions of power? How do you change systems of oppression and dynamics of subjugation, right? There are people who have trained in these things. And I think that part of the trap is to, to feel like, well, if they're not Buddhist, then maybe we don't fit into them. Or if they're not sort of totally aligned with our, you know, how we want to express our emotions or how we want to, um, you know, relate to property damage or whatever, then therefore we're sort of in opposition to them or that they're not aligned with, with our uh, aspirations. And I think that really is uh, the danger of feeling like, oh, that you go to protest or you go to engage in the world as a Buddhist versus as a human and as someone who cares and as someone who's humble to learn the ways that um, others are leading forward in the way to change things. Um, There are many people who, in our tradition, and as lay people, as monks and nuns, who have engaged the world in a beautiful way, who have brought the teachings to bear in a way that has, you know, been expansive. Of course, there are from other religious traditions, and of course, you know, to, to repeat, you know, Gandhi and um, Martin Luther King Jr.'s name is almost cliche at this point. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh, right? You have, of course, these beautiful beings who have done that work. And I think there's a lot to learn from them. And also with our practice to recognize that there are, we wouldn't have these teachings actually, if it weren't for people deciding to go sit in a cave through the revolution, 
right? And to actually withdraw and be in a monastery. And that puts us in a complicated position, I think, in terms of our own decisions. I think the easy part of it is, is that that's, if our deepest commitment is to get liberated in the Buddha's way and the enlightenment of seeing the arising and passing of all phenomena, and we actually are going to go live in a cave and going to go live in a monastery, then that's great. And I think that there, to really understand that that plays an important role in the long-term history of change and of the possibility of the freedom of the human heart. Um, but to not use that as an excuse as a person who's actually not living in a cave or not living in a monastery, that you are engaged in the world, to, to not take our human responsibility to show up and to be agents of the transformation um, that we know is necessary. I think there are... Um, I think one of the most important ways in which our meditation practice can inform our relationship to the social justice, to social change, and particularly right now to the subjugation of black people and to the efforts to support the liberation, whatever your identity. I mean, of course, I look through here and most of the people in this group are white uh, or non-black people of color. And so that, you know, depending on, on that, you know, depending on your social identity and uh, the lived experience of how safe uh, you are to take risks and uh, be in the world and our sort of respective privileges, there's all kinds of different expectations that we might have of ourselves and hopes and um, realistic, I think, requests that we might have or that the world might have of us. Um, the one of the most important parts of the practice is about our relationship to pain and how do we sit in discomfort, right? Physical, emotional, uh, psychic, spiritual discomfort. And what is our responsibility around that as yogis in our bodies, our minds, and in the world? I think, you know, we come to sit and you know, it's very rarely comfortable. You know, there's, it's often a very difficult experience to actually sit still for any period of time. And, and there is always going to at some point be physical pain that arises. And how we relate to that and how we're interested in that pain has important ramifications, I think, in terms of how we were relating to pain outside of us and how we're relating to uh, pain in the world in general. It takes courage to actually show up for it. There's a way in which when you sit uh, and a pain arises, you know, you can go through that emotional process of, and it's very hard to see, but where, where is pain something that's like, oh, deflating, like, oh no, it's that again. And we feel miserable about it. Or we feel hopeless about it. Where does it feel like it makes us angry or upset? You know, we have to see that there's a corollary to watching the news, to living your lives, to the pain that you're experiencing or seeing in the world around you every day. When you see anguish, when you see oppression, when you see violence, right? When you see subjugation, what is the emotional response to that that arises, right? From conditioning. Is there fear? Is there anguish? Is there hopelessness? Is there despair? Is it rage inducing? Is it anger inducing? These are all important things to recognize. And then to know, it's like, well, do we, what is the relationship we have with that rage? What is the relationship we have with the hopelessness? What is the relationship we have with the fear? And are we going to start following that train? Or where can we have gathered the strength of attention to be with the pain, to actually stay with the pain, to be willing to sit and face it, and to not, um, always follow the kind of emotional trajectory and intellectual trajectory that sort of keeps us sometimes distant from it. 
And then it's like, where do we have the strength to be with the despair, to be with the hopelessness, to be with the anger, to be with the rage, but not necessarily act out of those places, right? Not necessarily unload those feelings on other people, take responsibility for our hearts, for our minds in these places. So it's like the sense of this, we are in a society that is no, not in the same way avoiding the pain. And not because white America has like decided they're like enthusiastic about engaging the pain of black people, but of course, because black leadership in all of these places has decided again, <laughs> after, you know, again and again, that it's no longer their responsibility to feel all this pain alone, right? That it isn't actually just up to black people to feel the suffering that's imposed by, you know, racial oppression. That this pain actually does need to be shared. And that there is a way in which the rest of the country white non-black POC ha has a responsibility to take that up if we're willing to transform it, right? If we're willing to sort of show up for that and not be like, well, this is my pain or your pain or this person's pain. It's like, we know as yogis, this, this, this question of identification is so oppressive and part of the, the false perspective of reality. Where do we able to recognize pain and be able to feel it fully and not run from it, not be too overwhelmed by whatever our other secondary emotional responses might be, not too overwhelmed by hopelessness or by fear or by anger or by rage, right? And then of course we learn the tools to be with those things, to know, okay, there's times where we can be with those things. There's times where they are too overwhelming, where we take a break, where we move away, where we don't force ourselves into the flame of intensity all the time. Right. That's uh, that's how the three of us. That's how we teach. Right. Is okay when you're strong. When you feel capable, show up for the intense experience. Be interested. Be exploring. But when you're tired, when you're exhausted, when you're already at your emotional edge, and something difficult arises, oh, you know that by forcing yourself in there, is that going to be something that actually is liberatory, or does that actually create more cultivation of more aversion, more attachment? And as a society, there's that question of like, are, is this society going to keep expecting the people who are most subjugated and most oppressed to be the ones who, are, who have the highest expectation of spiritual uh, access in that ex experience, right? And it's like, oh, well, people should say, peaceful and people shouldn't get angry and people should be nonviolent. And, and these, it's like, well, we know from ourselves that it's like, if you're forcing your own attention when it's least capable, when it's most downtrodden and most exhausted, you know, exhausted, when you're forcing that to be in the heat of uh, the fire of dukkha, that it's not fair. It's not fair to the mind. It's not fair to the human system. And so perhaps those of us who might have more privilege of one way or another, more respite from that degree of, of lifetime and, and lifetimes of, of, of subjugation, right? That actually might take a little more responsibility to show up for uh, some of the risk involved in protest, some of the risk involved in uh, discomfort of, of challenging the humdrum and monotonous ways that uh, the subjugation continues and, and continues to create these cycles of, of disconnection and oppression. You know, we long for universal love, right? This idea of like, oh, we, we want to be able to love everyone equally, love irregardless of conditions. But we have to admit that there's no, there's no way to get to universal love if we don't also universalize pain. You, you can't skip that part. There has to be a deep understanding and, and experiential uh, embracing of the suffering uh, on the physical, heart level as much as possible and to not be acting out of our fear of that or unwillingness to bear that but trying our best to sort of you know to show up for that fully so that then we actually have access to the love because that's this other piece where it's like we sometimes can bifurcate love and rage uh compassion and anger and that's that's actually not really that helpful in the world or as yogis you know, that, that our anger, our rage, our frustration, um, our overwhelm, that is our ticket to understanding the pain, right? To understanding, it's like if you can feel and show up for how furious you are, right? Then 
we start to see that, okay, that, that we're usually angry. Anger arises because something we care about has been threatened. Something we care about has been harmed. Something we care about um, is facing annihilation, right? And whether that's ourselves, our family, our community, uh, that there, that is like the source. And it's, and it's our vulnerability under the threat of harm, under the threat of, uh, of oppression that, that anger shows up as a defense, you know, as an important protection actually for the heart that can't bear the intensity of reality. And so this sense of like, wow, how do we start to relate to our own anger that way? How do we look, start to relate to our own uh, despair that way? And how might that translate as you start to understand not just your anger, but anger as, as love, as a protection for your love? Right? How do you understand despair also as a protection for your vulnerability? Right? That it's not the truth. We're not trying to act out of that way. We're not trying to spill it all around us. But we recognize that as legitimate, bona fide protections of the heart that have developed because we don't have the capacity to be with the reality of things as they are. Because that's a very tall order. It's as the Buddha said, it's like the hardest thing to do. And so we take responsibility for that training, take responsibility for being able to bear the intensity of our emotions, to have compassion for ourselves, to give ourselves space. And that, that in a, as, a, as a person interested in change, that that must necessarily translate into what your expectations are of other people, what your, how, how you give space and permission and understanding for the reality that so many people in this world are in incredible pain and uh, don't have access to these tools. No one, you know, very few people, uh, especially really in the whole world, uh, have, have really been trained in, in these tools um, in the way that's really required to show up for that. So it's, again, it's like this sense of our understanding of pain of like, we need to be able to relate to it. We need to be able to have a relationship of interest, of engagement. We have to have compassion, space for it. And we also need to recognize that that is necessary with others. Um, and that there, that there is a powerful way in which the more we can do that, that it can inform our understanding of uh, some of these other places. So understand that pain can be concentrating. You know, if you're sitting there on your cushion and you have an irritation in some part of your body and you're just trying to avoid it, you're trying to go elsewhere, you're trying to bring metta, you're trying to, you're trying to kill it with love, you know, it's like, how, you, as a yogi, as a mature yogi, we all have to experience at some point, just going into the sensations is incredibly concentrating and that that concentration creates a lot of energy. It creates a lot of power. It creates the um, capacity for mindfulness to do its thing. And, and that is what's happening on a large degree socially, if you think about it metaphorically, that the world, our country at least, and the world really, a lot of people are really concentrating on this pain. They're not running from it. They're engaged. They're open. They're willing to bear the intensity and not just have one part of the world bear the intensity, right? Not one part of our human community bear that intensity. And you can see the concentration that's developing, the energy that's developing, the intensity that's developing. It's very powerful. And where can we use that in a way that is trying to protect the conditions for the flourishing of all people, but also creating the conditions under which we can, can develop processes of understanding? Right? We're not only involved as yogis, as Vipassana yogis in the practice of concentration. It's concentration so that we can be mindful, so that we can observe and understand. And that understanding, that social understanding actually also has to come from a place of safety. You can't expect the person being beaten by a police officer to have this like capacity to like in that moment just really try to understand like where that person is coming from right it's like it's not fair it's ridiculous it's like we actually need as a society to create the safe conditions under which these conversations engagements um decision making about what are our agreements that we're living to as a society how are those happening in the conditions of safety I think I'll just, I'll wrap up with two other small things. Um, the, 
there's there is a, a in our tradition a a deeply instilled notion that we are the owners of our actions. It's this um, kamasaka, as our team, the Pasan Hawaii team loves to. That's like our uh, team team chant. Ownership of action. And of course, in the ancient system, that is often of kama, of karma. That that is a formation that is often it's very personalized, right? It's very much like, well, something bad happens to you because you did something bad. Now, in the past, whether past life or five minutes ago or whatever, the metaphysics of that are not even worth thinking about, right? It maybe, maybe there's, maybe that's like entirely true. Maybe it's partly true. Maybe not. The idea that we are the owners of our actions, uh, and that we are responsible for bearing the burden of what we do and what's motivating our actions is undeniably true. And I think that what is the perhaps a more modern perspective and understanding is to really get that all action is individual. Even if you're doing it together, you are individually responsible for your actions in any moment. That, that, that all action is ultimately in, individual, but that actually all results are collective right? That actually there's no result of an action that only we carry the burden from. That on some level, the, 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 our actions are having impacts outside that are, and that we are the recipients of an unfathomably complex chain of past actions that are some of our own and of, of many others. And that, that, that reality, to live in the intensity of like, what does that mean we're inheriting in terms of, uh, all of the sort of social dynamics, right? All of the class, gender, race, uh, all of the aspects of human history and beyond that are crashing on this present moment, that we are the inheritors of so much past action. And yet we have responsibility, not only to ourselves, but to the whole world about, and that the responsibility is in every single moment of volitional impulse, of, of emotionally of whatever the emotion and volitional impulse motivating our action is that that is a very powerful and intense place to live and that we take that seriously that we take the the full extent of responsibility of our actions whether that's in regard to the movement right now around um you know the liberation of of black people from the oppression of uh, white supremacy, whether it's around war, whether it's around the politics, whether it's around whatever, or around our own meditation practice, around like getting that, like every moment of action has an impact on ourselves, on our own hearts, minds, and bodies, that there is something so essential to be living in that. You know, um, the, the Dalai Lama, he has that famous quote, um, you know, uh, my religion is simple. My religion is kindness. I think that's like, of course, we all, there's something, the reason that's became famous. It's very beautiful. It's very simple. We, you know, who can argue with the beauty and the eloquence of that? And I think the other part of like to remember that the Buddhist teaching is this balance between love and wisdom, that the, the Brahma Viharas, the loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity, the equanimity phrase is this kamasaka, ownership of action. So just as much as you could say, my religion is simple, my religion is kindness, to also really say and encourage you, all of us as yogis, as like honest people in this path, that my religion is simple, my religion is ownership of action. And to really feel the different energy of that, to really take responsibility for whatever social position you have, whatever conditions in your life you might have of like, where is your responsibility to the world? to the oppression and the pain of others? Where is your responsibility to your own pain, to your own oppression? Where do those things uh, support one another? Where are they in conflict? And not just take um, anyone's word or guidance or encouragement of believing that it's this is the way to do it or that's the way to do it, to know that whatever any of us say, whatever else you read, that ultimately the choice is yours and the responsibility is yours and the comma is yours and that you feel that you can live into that 
uh, with as much care, patience, kindness, protection as possible. So um, I'll end there. Um, thank you for you know uh, listening. I hope some of it was helpful. We have um, some time now, and uh, you know we're sort of actually kind of flexible with uh, with it. But some time for questions and answers. Um, Michelle sort of lead that part. The way that we're going to do that is um, you know you have, there's a little button on your screen where you can raise your hand. And um, we'll just, you know, keep an eye on whose hands are raised and, and try to address questions. They can be in terms of um, anything I've raised, the instructions that Steve offered, uh, anything about your practice or that you want to hear from the three of us, um, we're happy to offer it. Yeah. So, yeah, feel free to uh, raise your hand. And if no one raises their hand, maybe there's folks have some offerings. Should I go? Hi, Tracy, are you there? Yeah, sorry. Hi. Hi. Thanks so much. Um, I don't really know if I have a question, but um, I so uh, so I I'm in Minneapolis, um, and um, I I just so appreciate your your words tonight. Um, it's it's what's been whirling through my system. Um, And just really aware of um, what what's happening in here and what's happening outside of this system and how they're intertwined and, and, and really impact and inform each other. I had um, I I had a, a sit this week um, where I just the grief was so great. Um, and just all the um, images uh, from both, both um, that I experienced in person and, and uh, you know, on media. And then, and then compassion just came and, and, and there was this buoyant feeling and then today when tonight when I was meditating, um, the grief came again, and, and, but it was more like in in my system. And then I noticed I wanted I just wanted the compassion like I wanted to like I didn't want to be with it. Um, and then the compassion came like for this heart. Like I care about this too, this heart too. And it's, it's trying to discern where my role is. And like, like um, honor what I do do, what I am doing, and that I, I'm a part. Like it's not, it's easy to feel like it should look a certain way. So it's, it's like rich, rich practice in this world right now. So I don't even know, <laughs> except I'm just so grateful for Sangha and I am grateful for the practice and I, I feel so grateful to like, just have you bring out like the history too of like what we need to 
keep aware of. I appreciate that. I, I don't have, I feel like you've answered questions in the teaching. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, and if there's any, anything you want to say, I'm open to it, but I just, I just felt like I needed to say that. So thank you. Yeah, actually just good to get the Minneapolis um, connection. It's important, you know, so thank you. And yeah, I don't know, Steve, Michelle, maybe, do you guys have things you want to offer? Oh, Michelle, I, I have to un, yeah. Okay, can you hear me? I, I think I just want to thank you for um, expressing what it feels like to be there and the, just that I think there's, a nor there's an enormity of grief that we're all um, undertaking to find ways to relate to. And, you know, I have an older niece that she just said um, recently to me, I, I'm crying almost all the time. And I, I think that it was it was so important to hear for me her weeping just like it's so good to um it feels like how could most people not be weeping and, but i also feel like that you can you can only um your system your nervous system will regulate that and that for each of us the grief will have a mind of its own you know, and I think we all know what it's like, all of us, somebody we care about dies and how our system will um, not have to do that much about it because the grief will unfold over a year or five years or 10 years or a lifetime. It's like, um, you described that very beautifully. You described how the compassion came and went. you wanted it to be this way and then it didn't and then it came, the compassion came again. And, I think I would just amplify that for all of us to be careful about how we think it should be, that how we think that we should be, or like, well, I felt that it should go away, um, or that not to value numbness, not to value times when we can't feel anything, but let it, let it unfold as your system uh, can um, relate to with wisdom, compassion, and to relate to the numbness with wisdom and compassion. I think that that's, again, for all of us that uh, really respect how your system is relating to this and do just keep doing the best you can to um, find your way with it. You know, we're all in, this is all very new territory, I think, for all of us on this planet. And there is that range of um, extreme joy and sorrow as this is unfolding. But it's, as Jesse says, as Steve is saying, you know, that the pain being the pain is what our Buddhist practice has taught us how to be good at. Uh, Christina, are you there? Yes. Hi, Jesse. Thank Hi, you. Christina, my cousin. <laughs> um, it's really great. Um, I've never gotten to hear you speak. It was so inspiring and just like really, um, really helpful. I'm much more in the beginning of my journey on this. So um, I hope everyone will excuse if this question is like, is not appropriate in this like space, but um Something um, that concerns me is um, how white supremacy kind of, when we have white privilege and the way that 
kind of manifests in how we center our emotions and give our emotions um, more in importance and especially um, to people of color and black people uh, deal with it the most because of colorism and just our terrible history. So do you have any guidance around helping identify, um, you know, helping identify, like, yeah, just if that's an okay question to ask. And yeah. Do again. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I think I'll start and maybe these, you know, other folks might, might have some offerings as well. I mean, I, I think in a very broad sense that there's like a deep ethic in the tradition of that is that I would say is in alignment with that particular problem that you is, is commonly understood, right? Where there's a, uh, experience of like, you know, for example, right, the sort of like horrible subjugation of, uh, of black people, and that in the sort of space, especially in a space of black people or a space of people of color, that white people's emotions can sometimes come to dominate that space, right, the sort of like the grief and the sort of overwhelm. Um, I think that what's, it is an interesting place where just, I think the tradition would not for that particular reason, but that the practice is very much uh, encourages like of just this very deep sense of having developing the ability for all of us to just be with our emotions and that and to really and, and so because the problem there is not that white people or whatever are having the grief. It's just this understanding that in the context, in the social dynamic, that it's, it's re, like you say, it's recentering whiteness, it's recentering the sort of pain of white people versus where that kind of might otherwise play. So it's like this, this understanding that there's nothing wrong with the grief or the pain, or it's like, that's great, actually, that people feel these emotions. But where do we um, take such intense responsibility for feeling them, right? For feeling it in the body, for, um, and, 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 and then coming to a place of where, because we're not so terrified of the grief, we're not terrified of the overwhelm, that we can then make responsible decisions about our behavior, our vocal, our verbal behavior, our physical behavior, you know, our social behavior um, is, is sort of like this quintessential Buddhist thing because it's, it's the sense of the reason we yell at someone or the reason we um, explode emotionally is often, not entirely, right? But it's often because we can't feel, we can't bear, we don't want to feel the intensity of what we're feeling. And that there's a way that by having other people feel it, by having other people feel bad because we're angry, um, it projects the emotion onto someone else. We're making other people feel what we can't feel, what we don't want to feel. We don't feel like we can feel. And so this idea of like, yes, you're developing the ability to be like, wow, I am furious. I'm so angry and the rage is like shaking and, and it's like, and yet I, I am not afraid of that fire. I can feel that. And I'm not going to put that fire on someone else. I'm not going to make someone else burn because I can't handle my own fear. And like, that's this thing of taking responsibility for your actions. And so I think that's like, kind of more than almost anywhere else. It's like such a baseline thing in this tradition of like, and, and sometimes it's hard. The opposite is also true that in, you know, uh, in Burma, you know, the monks and nuns who, especially the monks, I'd say they're so reserved emotionally that there is this other side, right? Where it can, pl and, and that this also plays into, for folks who are more interested in sort of questions of whiteness and dharma this also plays into a little bit of the sort of other challenge of uh, where it can align with the kind of emotional reserve that is more european than latin american or african or other places right and so there's a way in which it's like oh this sort of emotional reserve which is that's how we're supposed to be operating and so anyone who's expressing emotion is therefore not being a good Buddhist. And so that's like the other, that's a trap at the other end, which is like, I'd say that, that how do we understand that it's very hard for all of us <laughs> to contain, just like, not just contain, but be totally mindful and totally at peace and totally uh, have all this capacity with emotion. So we have to have some flexibility with people expressing emotions too, right? Of like, this person's angry and this person's sad. And, and so there's this, there's this middle ground, which is also a very Buddhist thing of like, we're not just trying to repress, but we're also not trying to be just explosive. And where is this 
where is this middle ground kind of internally and where is it between people is a huge part, I think, of just, yeah, the, our responsibility as, as kind of practitioners, yeah. yeah. There's something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Steve, I don't know. Do you have something else to add yet, Steve, or do you want me to? Am I muted or am I on? Am I? Oh, um, you know, I think this is the heart of um, maybe a lot of the kind of um, time, but maybe the opportunity of the time you're in right now that um, where this practice has something to offer is that it, it all will come down to our motivation. And so like, I think that to kind of bring in, you know, like Steve's instruction, which was like being able to kind of take responsibility for your body, how, you know, your mind to calm down to, to and this now Jesse thing to experience your own experience, experience and motion that we actually usually will find out that we're crying because we care or we're a angry because we care and that one, when we can get to that place of care, the emotion is no longer self-centered. You, you see, and people feel that. People feel that in us, that, that if we're um, expressing emotion that is self-centered and is taking up all the air in the room, whether it's quiet or not, versus that we've taken responsibility for feeling it and are, are, have found this deeper motivation right, for the emotion, it no longer is self-centered and it's no longer, I think, um, offensive, <laughs> at, least, at least in terms of the, the uh, we've taken responsibility for the anger, the grief, or the fear, and we're able to find that deeper emotion of care. And then we can usually act, I, I'm kind of acting it up, but there's a flexibility in our action versus a rigidity, and we can usually if, we, if we're in a situation where, as a white person of privilege, we need to, we can step back, right? Like, we don't have to, we don't have to be the one who has the um, airtime at this point in time and how important that is. I think that's a very good question. Yeah. Really awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Really appreciate it, Jesse and Michelle. Mm, good to see you. Um, Kay, here we go. Are you there? Yeah. Hey. Um, I'm non-Black POC and I'm not American, um, but I've spent half of my life, so like more than 17 years in the States. And um, actually with this practice, I start to feel microaggressions towards POC people, including myself. Um, yet I came here to for the dream of quote unquote American dream. Um, and I start to see bias that I have towards black people because the education or the information in modern Japan were really built upon a lot of like white supremacist point of view, really. Um, and, oh, it's very hard. Um, what's happening right now, like what, the concentration is happening, like you said, and I think the stillness was there that was needed because of the pandemic. And it's really, really, it's like, a we are having retreat <laughs> and that's because it, it for me it's there like nothing changed like retreat nothing changed <laughs> like it's still like all the thoughts and anger and frustration and doubts and everything is there and yet like i don't know there's i can't help myself and i'm allowing there's a judgment towards please do better to white folks and for myself too and like how much of a bias I've had and yet there it's not 
sometimes I feel like blaming, like straight up blaming <laughs> um, to some people. Sometimes I do feel it's not blaming, but please feel this pain. Like, please feel it because the differentiation is so thin and it's confusing. Um, it's not ill will. <laughs> Sometimes it is. Um, and I'm not trying to stop it. I don't know. I think there's some doubt in there that <laughs> maybe somebody can say something. Thank you. I can start. I don't know if you guys have any other. I don't know. I just think it's it's awesome. It's so pure. You know. I mean, I think that that's like that level of internal and external honesty is really just what we all really need to be doing. Of getting like there are places where we all have conditioning that's problematic, you know, and and that we're, of course, we're going to judge other people. You know, I mean, the Buddha didn't, you know, this whole idea of being non-judgmental, that's not, I don't think that word exists in Pali. It's not a, it's not a Buddhist thing. That is like a Western new age kind of thing. There is about like, yes, are you, are, do you have ill will? Do you have aversion? But the Buddha himself was like incredibly discerning about like, that's really unwholesome action or that's like really wholesome action. And so this idea that like to, to, to identify something as like problematic is it, we can interpret that as like, oh, I'm being judgmental versus like your clear seeing, you know? So, you know, I just think it's like, that is the process that we all basically should be in. It's like taking responsibility for our minds in the sense of like not blaming ourselves for our conditioning, but also seeing that like, wow, these patterns are there. And actually the practice trains us to observe thought and actually to have a little bit of this deepening relationship of, of non-identification with it, really to see thoughts as conditioned from past action and to be willing to like, wow, you're on this, there's this unfolding of like this huge force of past action that is, that is pushing this momentum forward. And where do we keep pushing it in a certain way? Where do we push it in another way? Where do we just observe? I mean, those are things that are sort of up to us and, um, you know, I, I think, anyway, I just, I feel like you're doing it and I don't have any, you know, there's, it's just awesome. And I, and I think that like, there's also some place where I think we need to have a little lightheartedness about it at times. It's one of the things, you know, Steve knows better than I about Hawaii that has been like so amazing and like a relief is like people joke about race a lot. There's like, just like for people from, uh, from different like from different asian backgrounds from you know hawaiian backgrounds Haole, uh it's like people are people are playful about pointing out cultural difference because it's like culture actually is real right like that there are ways in which like people behave and tend to behave in ways that are not you know that are based on sort of like yeah where they grew up and how that happened and there's something about it where it's like we shouldn't expect we can do that with people who we don't know, <laughs> but, but in, in, there is like, oh, there's like, wow, there's a sense of cultural capacity that like, wow, we actually could develop a human culture that was more, it didn't just feel personal. Like our, 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 our complexities around race and around frustration with other people's behavior, that it's not just like stuck in our heads that actually we can have some like beautiful, lighthearted, even at times, like healthy and get conversation with each other around it. It doesn't always have to feel like, oh my God, now we're going to talk about like the most heavy, awful stuff that we all know that there are ways in which it's like, boy, but until we can't, or until we can do that, where is there also some lightness of being like, oh, just seeing the ridiculousness of maybe your own thoughts, you know, or the ridiculousness of someone else's thoughts. And that sometimes it's not always just like the clenching of like, I'm a bad person or that they're a bad person, but of like, wow, these patterns are so deep, you know? Yeah, I don't know if you guys have more you want to add. I can't hear. He's, he's, I think he's not. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I think um, it's just important, basic, just to remember that you can't control the, that the thoughts that come. Like that, that if you have a the most horrendous thought, you didn't, you didn't choose that that thought came up. And so that, that's really important that so much of it 
is conditioning and karma. And um, this is the, this is again, the whole teaching of the Buddha that you have choice, not in what thought appears. That's your birthright. That's the conditioning, but that you have a choice of how you relate to the thought that the liberation, again, we have to kind of go back to that basic thing that it, it's not what's appearing but how you're relating to what's appearing and and you know we all have um you know the big joke is would you want your like during this guided sitting that steve gave would you want your thoughts broadcast to everybody while we were sitting well nobody would volunteer for that nobody it would be humiliating <laughs> nobody nobody would want their thoughts broadcast because you can't control them you can't just sit there and broadcast you know all love it's like not possible so it's it is that it does require that um enough practice to remember that most of the thoughts are not worth um spending a lot of time with it it's like most of our thoughts are generic and conditioned and some thoughts you learn to discern as helpful and that that's freedom freedom is always it's always coming down to motivation and freedom not um thinking you can control what thoughts are appearing in your mind but how you're relating to them and then of course how what the action is you know that's that that's the hard work and I just want to add to Kay, as someone who's yeah. like done a lot of retreats and, yeah. you know, as many folks here have, you know, there are times where, you, you know, if you're in an intensive period of practice and you're really sitting, there are just going to be times where you, there's just this stream of just ridiculousness, you know, it's just like, it's like movies or things that don't, or just like total incoherent, just jibber jabber in your mind, right? It's just like, blah, 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 like floods that are nonsensical or floods that are, you know, just like in some, some other, uh, you know, but for, or music, right? Sometimes it's just like you have music stuck in your head or scenes from a movie or, or whatever. Um, I think that's like such an important experience to have for this reason and to kind of remember of like, there is some degree at which like you just, why is it that we identify with certain thoughts and not others? Like, why do we think of like, oh, these, these thoughts are like alien. Like somehow these are just kind of like coming and we don't know where they belong to, but this thought is my thought and I'm a bad person for that thought or I'm a really great person for that thought or, you know, and that to really get that, like, we are so conditioned, most of us one way or the other, most of us are conditioned to be like self, uh, you know, self-denying self, like around self-hatred, right? Of like, whatever thought we have, it's like, oh, to feel guilty about it, to feel like it's wrong. Other people, it's like, you have a thought, I'm like, geez, I'm like a genius, you know? And there's like, and to really get this, like, it's actually not that personal. It's like, it's so conditioned. And why do the self-aggrandizing types have so much confidence in their thoughts and the self-hatred types have so much doubt in their thoughts uh, in themselves because of their thoughts and and getting out of that is like a very difficult as you know and very sticky uh aspect of the practice but it requires going through it over and over again it just requires watching things more and more clearly and seeing it's like well why don't i think the dreams are my fault like we feel like dreams just kind of happen to us, but these thoughts I'm responsible for. And it's like, well, where is that boundary? And to be curious and to bring a little bit of, again, this sort of like some levity to it, some lightness of just being like, there is this flood of just conjuring that the mind is doing and that there's a flood of, of um, patterning around how we're relating to those thoughts and how we're relating to those uh, conditions. That is very, 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 maybe the most, deeply held place of where we're holding ourself together and you have to have some patience of course that kindness for just being like wow we're the fear is so great the vulnerability is so great that that the self-hatred is a defense or the arrogance is a defense and because it's a way to solidify ourselves and to have some care and some patience for that as well as like being like oh it's exhausting and you're, you know you're over time trying to unhook from it hmm. Um, we do have a few more questions and I know we're past 3.30, but, um, do you feel like, I don't know, the two of you guys, can we t take a few more or what do you think? Michelle and Steve. Oh, I can't hear Steve. Let's yeah. see. 
Steve, what do you think? Um, I'm happy. I'm happy for people to continue asking questions. Yeah. And if people have to go, that's okay. Yeah, I'm yeah. Happy. Okay. Um, Michelle? Yeah, it's okay. I think okay. I don't want people to get too tired, but I think. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll do these two more. We'll take these last two. So, uh, Susie, are you there? Hi. I'm here. Hi. Um, thank you for practice as always. I guess um, I just like wanted to name a couple, a few things for myself. Um, you know, my parents are immigrants to this country from Korea and I was born here. Um, so I come to this conversation from that lens. And I think like one of the things I want to name that is that it's so hard. It's been so hard to share like practice space with um, people who are just new to this conversation. Um, it's been pain, it's been like, you know, I'm not trying to shame anyone. <laughs> I think my challenge around this, like, I mean, this is sort of the reason why I started, pra this is one big compelling reason I began practice maybe two or three years ago is because I identified so much as a nice Midwestern gal. <laughs> and I think was really socialized to like, put my anger aside and this was the one place where like I really felt a lot of anger and violence towards other people because it felt righteous like I felt right in um in my anger because people have been suffering um because although we're all conditioned the power that we're given in this society is so imbalanced and so um you know, I thought practice would allow me to find a way to, to engage with others um, and like work with my own internal violence. And the, basically it's like this challenge of like, how do I have space for my own dignity and safety without making somebody else bad um, or have to ask like, or have to leave the space completely. And, you know, I think I resist, or what comes up for me, like what's been coming up for me a lot is um, it's hard to share space and practice around this time because, I mean, it always is in general, and I generally seek out BIPOC spaces, but um, those aren't as available and with such like wonderful teachers. Um, I mean, they're all great teachers. It's just, I wanted the opportunity to practice with you all. Um, and in my in my like in my new my new path in these like last two or three years, um, I've always experienced practice as a place to sort of like I've just been noticing a lot of like hardening, embracing, and um, like resisting practice inside of me, and um, and maybe some attachment to like wanting myself to be softer and more open and to have that feeling of connection that I often did experience in my practice um, mm -hmm. of just like being with myself. But maybe it's this feeling of like, I have to be defended and I have to go into my head because we're all so socialized. Um, like, I feel like I need to use my head because that's been what I need to like have a braced aggressive body <laughs> And like a mind that is at attention and scanning because um, it feels really easy to be hurt, I guess, ultimately. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. And I think like, I also just want to name, I think for me in a lot of meditation spaces, I've been told by a teacher recently that, um, you know, like, a gift I have is that I want to face into the things that are hard. Um, but the challenge around that is I, I want to force everybody, including myself, to be looking at it all the time. And the origin of that impulse, I think, is because my lived experience has not matched what everyone else seems to be. I mean, I don't know. That's just my interpretation, obviously. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's, I guess, a, a, something that I have like resistance to is a teaching around like 
um, you know, like cultivating positive feelings, taking breaks, like, you know, the, the keeping light piece around it. I know it's necessary because I'm learning about why that's necessary. And yet it's still so difficult because I think I've already felt so much spiritual bypassing from different communities, even in just the two years that it's like, how do people know when they're spiritually bypassing and just resisting, like looking into what's hard versus um, finding resource? Sorry. It's yeah. To talk. No, it's awesome. <laughs> There's a, it's a thank you. I know you just, uh, Susie just muted herself, but I think it's, you know, every single one of those pieces is super meaningful. And I don't know, um, you know, between us, where we'll get to all of it, but um, the things, I don't know if you got, I, I, can I, is it okay if I jump in? You guys, yeah, all right. Um, I mean, the things that really, uh, for me, first sort of like the impulse of just, of really getting like that bracing uh, of yourself, you know, you feel that sort of emotional hardening and to, you know, that's like just, that's exactly what we teach of understanding that like, you have to allow for that. You have to totally get that the system does not feel safe and appreciate that, right? That the system is, the, 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 in that particular moment, the uh, equanimity, the loving kindness, the patience, the compassion, whatever those kind of beautiful qualities might be, they're not strong enough to show up for the intensity of what's arising. Uh, emotionally, psychologically, whatever, right? And so we have very amazing defense systems that have developed in light of perfect wisdom and perfect, you know, uh, equanimity. And, and, and so like, we can't, we shouldn't, again, it's part of like, yes, on the, on the long term, we see the downsides of those. We see how we can harm ourselves and others through those processes, definitely. And we have to understand them as like natural protections and be patient with ourselves and be patient with and care for like, and be amazed and, and appreciative that your system knows how to protect itself through this kind of shutting down, the clenching, the whatever, whatever sort of, you know, other things that arise out of that. And slowly just, you know, we build a relationship with that. We build a relationship of care with it, of understanding with it and realize it's, it's not the problem. It, when it arises, we recognize it's protection great. And when it doesn't, when we, we don't, the heart doesn't need that protection, it's not there. And we're, the mind is able to be with things in a different way. You know, the piece around Sangha as people of color in the West right now, I mean, that's a, that's a whole incredible longer kind of conversation. I think that there's, I, I think what you just expressed is like a, a incredibly resonant with like, right, hundreds of thousands of other people uh, of that experience of like, how do you, who love the practice and love the teachings and want to get deeper into it, and become involved in a community where the, it's mostly white, where there's whatever class issues, this idea of like really feeling like, oh, we actually don't feel safe in these spaces because there's all kinds of microaggressions. There's all kinds of other sort of processes happening in which it's like, actually, I can't find the relaxed conditions under which you're supposed to be doing the meditation practice. And I think that's just like a huge, long conversation that we won't have time for here. But I want to say that I think that mostly it's important to lose hope that white sanghas will change. I, I think that like it's that work is important. People need to be confronted with racism. People need to, you know, but on the other hand, it always ends up being work that falls on the people of color. It's always exhausting. It's always depleting. Uh, and at, so, at some point, people really need to develop spaces that are their own spaces. So it's not like a, a white space that's um, comfortable for people of color. It's like, oh, there's people of color spaces. And thank God we're in a place where that's much more common, right? Where that's, that's happening. And uh, that it's, it's not like that. A lot of that work is done. Though, of course, then there's a billion other pieces of work that aren't done uh, that are just make those communities also very difficult, uh, you know, if we're involved in them. The point is, is there is this dance that the Buddha also spoke of. And I just think that we're in a time where it's really important of like Sangha is ultimately, it's like so important. And it's also 
not so important that we have to stay in relationship with communities that are that are not creating supportive conditions for our practice. And the Buddha is very explicit about it. You know, it's worth looking, I would say, in the book I just wrote, I'll leave a few things. There's a book that I think folks who are interested should read called The Social Dimensions of Early Buddhism by um, Uma Chakravati. Uh, that talks a lot about some of the earlier stuff I was saying. The, there's a couple chapters in my book that really describe the sort of dance between like wanting to be a part of community, getting the value of community, and what is the part of our practice where we really need to be independent, where we are like, wow, there might be some period of time where we're safer to practice alone. And it, it, feel, it can feel painful, it can feel unfair, but that that's actually like the safest and most fruitful way to practice. Or that we understand that there's a dance that we're playing in that. And the Buddha is very clear, you know, there's no, you know, it's better to wander like a rhinoceros in the woods and to practice in a condition that's just causing more mayhem for us. So, and that, that even at his time, that there was plenty of places where there was like, in his own Sangha, he recognized that people were just actually not creating the container for practice to be fruitful. I have, I have something. Mm -hmm. Do I, am I on? Yeah, you're um, on. Yeah, I think I, there's so much to this question that I don't feel like we can give it the time it deserves. Um, but I, I kind of want to, if it's okay to address it from a kind of a place of, um, That the, the issue of safety and trust is um, whether we're alone or with a few people or a group is um, it's so it's such a big exploration and and I would say that again at times being able to come into this place of uh, seeing in terms of our practice that there has to be a certain respect for pace and so that that um i would encourage you to start perhaps looking at when when things are neutral neutral because my own experience in my own way of kind of dealing with what you're saying is um when things would get when i would feel like things were getting uh spiritually bypassed <laughs> um, and I would get so enraged I can't even tell you this rage would come up um, at the at the denial and the passivity um, in the milieu that I was in it was very helpful for me to look at that I where I was getting triggered was that I was all, all, also feeling erased. I was feeling obliterated by that. And I, um, it was so painful. I had to spend a lot of time kind of in my own uh, self retreats, kind of exploring where I needed to take responsibility for that and where I needed to speak out and, and I feel like that, that exploration has continued for me. I see that as a exploration this lifetime, that, that um, wherever I get triggered in those situations that feel really important to um, address internally when I'm spiritually bypassing myself and I have to go at the pace I can go myself, <laughs> that that teaches me a lot at, at other people's paces, but also like there's a question of, well, when do I speak and how important that is as well. So I, I wanna honor you for bringing up that question and um, how extra complicated it must be if you're a person of color at, at this time on the planet. And uh, yeah, it's great that there's enough, I think, enough sensitivity in some places uh, right now that you can bring it up and explore it, I hope. <laughs> mm. 
All right, we'll do this last one. I said I would. Here we go. Marianne, are you there? Yes. Marianne, hi. Um, just one off note also that there's a question from Kristen Stake, who was on mm -hmm. Facebook. <laughs> um, could you talk more about the comment you made about that you can't go to universal love without also, I can't quite get your wording, but making the pain universal? Just a few more sentences about what you mean and also what you see as the kind of wise pathways for making more of that pain universal. I think, you know, in my view right now, I just think there are different dimensions around that, that there's, in terms of like our, our personal practice, it's like to under, it's like the, the relationship of the development of love beyond conditions is totally dependent on the ability to have, be at peace regardless of conditions and our totally our ability to be peaceful regardless of conditions is totally dependent on our ability to love uh, in a conditionless way and so that that those two things unfold that 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 the capacity to truly love to really feel the sense of love for all beings uh, it requires of course a deep personalization uh, of of the experience of love, right? That it's like, it, it, because it is, it is, it has reached a point that is not just being love based on behavior or love based on a certain expectation, that it's love based on just the worthiness of beings being cared for. Um, similarly with compassion, right? It's like the flavor of love directed toward pain and hardship. The sense that like, if we're really expect ourselves and have the aspiration to like really truly be able to feel compassion that there has to be a way for the pain in the world and for all the pain of everyone there has to be a way that we are unhooking from our personal pain from our the idea of like oh it's my just my grief or just my knee or you know just my own sort of piece in the of my the background of my lives not to say that those aren't incredibly important things to wrestle with my own personal pain is like important and and, you know, there is a level to which it's like, at some point, it does need to get decoupled from that sort of identification with the, the personal experience of it, in order to be able to, to really get that when the mind is capable of totally accepting all the pain, or all the rage, that it isn't just your rage or just your pain. It's like, when someone comes at you and they're angry, they're not, it's not their anger. There's a way that like, that process of um, of non-personalization, right, of, of uh, non-identification has this liberatory quality and then develops that sort of capacity. I think socially it's different. There's a, you know, like, I don't think we should be expected all, s the enlightened society can't be dependent on everyone getting enlightened. That's like, will never happen, right? So this question of like, how then do we start to see that, well, for example, like the fact that healthcare is private, Right, we live in a society in the states here. Some of you are elsewhere, happily for this reason, that like healthcare is private, and the implication is that like well, that means our pain is private, our our sickness is private. It's a private problem, and I think that like as a society, there's a sense of like well, actually, maybe that's like a totally a framework that's like just doesn't is not true and dysfunctional. So whether it's a matter of like seeing things because they're actually this person's pain is actually not separate from my pain or that it impacts me or that I feel not just separate in the impact either, but that I kind of share that experience of dukkha and suffering, that those are sort of different levels of getting to a similar process of like, well, actually as a society, we can't just have black people feeling this pain, right? And we can't keep making, you know, black people be the people who are having to fucking deal with it and re wrestle with it, that it actually needs to be socialized, that this is like, no, this is our pain experienced historically and for generations by a particular element of our community, but that like, actually it's not just this particular part of our community's responsibility to be feeling it anymore. And that there is a, what are the processes around that socialization of pain? I think are 
are an experiment. And I think it's something that is part of what is happening. And it's messy because then it's like, you can't have white people being like, oh, I feel that. And it's like, well, okay, you didn't really feel that. And that's different. Uh, but, but there's some part of that process that's going to be messy, but I think is necessary if, if there's going to be like that, these hopes of like a, a, a harm to any one of us is a harm to all of us or all of that stuff. It's like, we actually need to practice and find ways of building systems, like say a healthcare system that, that is like, no, actually our pain is shared. Our pain is mutual and, and universalized. Mm. Hey, Jesse, um, this is Angela. Um, and Good to meet you, finally. Yeah, <laughs> nice to see you. Mm. Um, as one of the few Black people here, I mm. really wanted to say something. Um, I appreciate that we're all in our practice and we're all where we are and we're growing. But something in my heart hurt when I hear people talking about, in a way, needing to be convinced of Black people's humanity. You know, like, I don't want to carry all of that baggage. It's not mine. You know, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't want to carry all of that pain. It's not mine. You know, and if I don't start from deep compassion, I just feel broken open by it. You know, I don't want, I don't want to carry someone else's pain about my suffering, right? It's enough to carry my own pain about my own suffering. Um, and enough to use that to grow in my own practice. And so part of what I would ask this song or anyone to do is to think about what that means. Can I, re can I restate it as a question to make sure that like the, the request is clear? Sure. Yes, Jesse. That, yes. That, that, yeah, that people, that people explore, what does it mean to have to have black people take bear the responsibility for their emotional their lack of emotional resolution around race or something is that a is that a good way of starting to frame it yes yeah yeah i think that's thank you and i and i like yes everyone i mean i think that that is um you, know, you see it on on social media a lot right where it's like people are uh, engaging across lines of difference around topics that are, you know, very emotional and very evocative. And I've seen a number of instances where, you know, white people are trying to be, feel connected and feel uh, like they're helping and supportive and, and want to be in relationship with black people around what's happening, whether they're friends or people they don't know. And and you can tell me if this is, if, if what I'm trying to just describe is what you're talking about, and so folks, it's like, but there is an emotional need sometimes on the part of, of the white folks to be met, right? To be like, to, to feel resolved and to feel like, uh, I, to be reaffirmed, to feel like their, um, their relationships are okay, their behavior is okay. Um, and that that's actually part of this place where it's like an extra burden on black people to have to deal with that and take responsibility for your emotional needs in this moment. Um, so just, Angela, I just want to double check of like, if that feels like a good sort of offering to folks of like, to really get that like you take, if you're really, if you're white or a non-black POC at this point, it's like, to take responsibility and not dump your, um, n not have your emotional needs have to be fulfilled by black people in this moment. It's like they're bearing enough and have, or maybe ever, <laughs> right? It's like, there's like, been like oh, only 500 years of like having to deal with that. It's like, maybe that's actually your job and, and um, to, to do. So just to kind of double check um, that I just, if, if that feels like a, a, a somewhat succinct to kind of um, re-offering of that question to the group. I just, I really, I really thank you for that. And yeah. Yeah. Um, and talking about bringing the likeness, Jesse, that was great. Um, and yeah, I mean, yeah, 
preferably never, but you know, we're growing together. That's, <laughs> part of, that's part of what we do here. That's part of, you know, that's part of our practice, right? Um, that's part of why we're together in practice um, so that we learn and grow from each other, right? Mm -hmm. But that to not put that burden on someone else is part of us being responsible for our own actions. Like going back to what you were saying earlier, it's like, and, and you know, I, 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 what you said about all action is individual, but all results are collective really resonates in part because of that. It's like, you know, you might do this, but you harm our community, right? And so it's all of our responsibility collectively um, to interact around what that harm is and how we can help you grow and how we can help our community heal. Um, so thank you, yes. Thank you, yeah, awesome. I think that's a good note to leave it on. Hmm. <sighs> Powerful times, everybody. It's good, it's like so good. We're doing it, it's happening. People are doing it, play your part, take care of each other and yourselves. Hmm. Thank you for showing up. Yeah. Hmm. All right, love to you all, take care. <laughs>